Today, I will be showing you how to build and fly an SSTO space plane in order to satisfy the contract, rescue a Kerbal from orbit of Kerbin. In fact, I will be building two. One will use a combination of air-breathing jet engines and rocket engines, specifically the J-X4 Whiplash and the T-1 Dart Toroidal Aerospike, while the other will feature the versatile CR-7 Rapier engine. Along with the builds, I will be showing you how to get your space planes efficiently into orbit and how to bring it back down to the surface and safely land it on the runway. Let's get started. And we'll start by taking a look at the contract, Rescue Alec A from Orbit of Kerbin. Pretty basic, all we got to do is rescue Alec A Kerman, who is stranded in low orbit, and return her safely to Kerbin. Now, I have covered contracts like this in the past, but I wanted to have a contract to motivate the building of these space planes, so here it is. Let's take a quick look at where I am on the tech tree. For our build, you will need to have the aerodynamics branch unlocked out to hypersonic flight. I should also mention that this video is really the second of a two-parter. In the previous tutorial, we worked through a number of the jet engines in the game, starting from the Weasley and working our way up to the Whiplash. In this video, we'll be picking up where the previous one left off. So if you want the complete build, you will need to start there. But before we get started, let's talk a bit about single stage to orbit vehicles as they come in a wide variety of flavors, including ones that are really just regular rockets that happen to be single stages. For this tutorial, I'm restricting myself to space planes, and specifically space planes designed solely to get into low curve in orbit, perform a task, and get back down again. This tends to be the way I use them in my own games because a vessel designed both for atmospheric and vacuum flight is going to need to make compromises in both. For that reason, I tend towards building vacuum only vehicles that stay in space while SSTOs bring up and down crew and cargo. If you want to step up your SSTO game beyond this video, I would strongly recommend Veos' channel as, in my opinion, he builds some of the most creative vessels out there. With that out of the way, let's start with the whiplash centered jet that I concluded the previous video with. The only engines on this thing are these jet engines which will not operate once there is too little oxygen in the air to burn. For this to work in space, it's going to need some rocket engines, and the engines I'm going to use are the T-1 Toroidal Aerospike Dart liquid fuel engine. Taking a quick look at the stats, note the at sea level thrust of 153 kilonewtons compared to the vacuum thrust of 180 kilonewtons. The difference between these numbers is relatively small when compared to other rocket motors. The same is true with ISP, 290 seconds ASL and 340 seconds in vacuum. Though it is a rocket engine, the DART still performs decently in an atmosphere. And if we compare its 340 second vacuum ISP with common vacuum only engines like the Terrier at 345 seconds or the Poodle at 350 seconds, we can see that it doesn't sacrifice that much for the broader performance range. In fact, its 180 kilonewton vacuum thrust gives it a better thrust to weight ratio than either the Terrier or the Poodle, with only a slight drop in efficiency. This makes it an ideal choice for our purposes and also demonstrates why it is packaged in the same tech node as the Whiplash jet engine. I'm going to slide back these radial tanks to provide a mounting surface for our new engines. By the way, you don't have to wait to be this deep in your career before your first SSTO. You can make an SSTO space plane using Weasley Jets and Terrier engines. Here I have a space plane I made during a live stream that's all low tier rockets, specifically two Reliance and a Terrier. However, you will find low tier space planes more challenging to build and fly than the later tier ones. This trend continues as the SSTO I'm going to build after this one will be an easier craft than the one I'm making now. And given that everything a space plane can do can be accomplished more easily with rockets, you'll have to make your own decision as to when the cool factor outweighs the effort. Let's fix up our staging. 
we want the whiplashes to come on first, but at some point in our flight, we're going to want to switch over to the vacuum dart engines. And the best way to accomplish that is with action groups. On action group one, I'm going to toggle the dart engines. Then I'll select the whiplashes and toggle those engines as well. So now every time I press one, I'll alternate which set of engines are the active ones. Also, the darts do not require air intakes, and these intakes generate more drag when they are open. So on the same action group, I also want to toggle the state of the air intakes. So I'll get these two here, and also the one at the front. So now one toggles this plane between air breathing and closed cycle mode. We'll also remove this barometer, which I don't need anymore, and although I'm not going to be doing any docking in this video, I would like this vehicle to be capable of it. So I'm going to add a Mark II Clampatron, which fits in nicely with the other Mark II parts and nicely opens and closes so it doesn't induce much drag. I also really don't like how these radial tanks are interfering with this control surface. This is really an aesthetic choice as this will still work, but I'm going to remove the smaller elevons, slide the bigger ones over, and center the tanks in the space left behind, and I'm also going to activate the pitch on these to provide some more pitch authority for my plane. Now the darts are rocket motors and thus needs onboard oxidizer, of which this plane has none. We need to rectify that. I'll start by adding two FL-T400 fuel tanks. These are great because they have the same dimensions as the Mark I liquid fuel fuselage and can even be textured white so you can barely tell the difference. We'll put the darts back on and slide these forwards with the whole thing looking better already. But we still need more oxidizer, so I'll remove these forward Mark I liquid fuel tanks and replace them with another pair of FL-T400s. And finally, I had previously removed the oxidizer from the Mark II bicoupler at the back and the adapter at the front, so I can simply just put that back. You may be wondering, how do I know how much oxidizer to put on? There's no simple formula that I am aware of, so the answer is just to test. I put on some oxidizer, tried to reach orbit, at which point I ran out of oxidizer. So I put on some more and tested it again. Keep repeating until you achieve orbit with enough oxidizer left over to accomplish whatever mission you have in mind for your plane. In fact, when I did achieve orbit, I realized I had too much liquid fuel left over. That's just extra mass I don't need, so I removed the liquid fuel from these rear FL-T400 tanks and from the forward Mark II adapter. This balancing of liquid fuel and oxidizer is, in my opinion, the most difficult part of building an SSTO. Also to save mass, I removed the standard canards that I was using as rudders and replaced them with a pair of structural wing type Ds with Elevon 4s and tweaking off the pitch and the roll. We're almost there. We're going to put on RCS, which of course requires monoprop. So I'll put back the 25 units that I previously removed from the cockpit. That plus the 75 units that comes with the docking port gives us plenty for our purposes, especially if I use the smaller RV-1X thruster blocks rather than the larger RV-105s. These smaller ones are a tenth of the mass, have much less drag, and just sip the monoprop when compared to their larger cousins. For these reasons, unless I'm working with a large vessel, I much prefer them to the bigger ones. We're going to put on a total of eight, placed roughly equally forward and aft of the center of mass of the vehicle. Don't forget to toggle off the yaw, pitch, and roll so you don't use monoprop when adjusting attitude. I'll also switch to the five-way variant so I'll get dorsal and ventral thrust out of these two. I'm using the textures on the tank to place the lower ones so that the blocks are directly above and below each other. And then it's four more at the back, but if you look at these in count, there are eight nozzles pointing forward and aft, while only four pointing in the other directions. To get this all the same, I change the forward ones to the three-way variant. Not a big deal, but I like it. And finally, I want some electrical generation, so I added a set of SP-W 3x2 solar panels, and after translating them back a little bit, and adjusting the center of lift so it is just behind the center of mass, this thing was ready to fly. Now before we actually put this thing into orbit, let's talk a little bit about the game plan, because it's got to think a little bit like a jet, 
a little bit like a rocket. It's kind of a combination of the both. So the first thing is, is that the jet engines are far more efficient than the rocket engines. So you want to get as much speed as you can out of those jet engines before you switch to the less efficient closed cycle mode. And we saw last episode that the Weasleys, if you can get them in around the 18, 19, 20 kilometer range, you can get them going at about 1.2, 1.3 kilometers per second. That's going to be the goal. So our first goal is to get up to about that altitude, 18, 19, 20 kilometers, get the speed around 1.2, 1.3 kilometers per second or as fast as we can get it. Then we switch into rocket mode and then after that we need to get our profile closer to what we would typically have at that altitude for a rocket flight. Okay, so with that in play, let's get this thing going. So take the brakes off, uh, throttle is up already so we just have to punch it. Obviously, we got to let ourselves get up to an appropriate speed here, maybe 70, 80 meters per second. Let's start pitching up, see if we can get off the runway. We are off, gear up, and what I want to do is keep my heading at around 90, but I want to get this prograde vector to be just above 10 degrees above the horizon. Up there, come a little bit to the left here a bit to get that heading back to 90. As always with any kind of flight, the less fiddling you do, the more efficient your flight is going to be. So there, we got this right around where we want. Uh, prograde vector is about 10 degrees. And now I really just want to leave it alone. Let this thing ride up. Remember the whiplashes, as you pick up speed, will pick up thrust and you can see that our speed is growing exponentially. And that's what we want. So that by the time we get up to around that altitude we're looking for, 18, 19, 20 kilometers, we're going to be going very, very fast. Now, it will naturally want to pitch up as you ascend, so every once in a while you'll want to pitch down a little bit. Get it again closer to around that 10 degree mark. But otherwise you're going to leave it alone. Starting to see some of these flame effects. Don't let that bother you. Uh, the game rather exaggerates them. Again, I'm going to pitch down just a little bit here. Get closer to that 10 degree mark. Closing in there. We just passed 14 kilometers in altitude. Speed is now closing in on 1.2 kilometers per second. That's what we like to see. And I'm going to start leveling off a little bit. Just to let that speed really build. Keep an eye though on this vertical speed indicator. You do not want to see that going down. Now we had a change in tone in the engine. That tells me that I am getting close. So now I'm just watching my speed. And as it starts, see it's starting to level off. So I'm going to push one and put on those toroidals. And then what I want to do is I'm now in rocket mode. So I want to start to ascend like a rocket. We are too low. So I'm going to pitch up to about a about 20 degrees. Now right now, if you look here, you can see I am pitched hard over, hard up, <laughs> because this thing wants to go and follow this prograde vector, but as the air gets thinner, it will be get easier and easier to kind of hold that pitch of about 20 degrees. I'm also watching my time to apoapsis, so I want to reduce throttle. My time to apoapsis is at about 50 Five, 56 seconds. I want to keep it around there. I do not want this, that apoapsis to get away from me. And again, I want to be pulling up that prograde vector. Let's see if it'll settle around 20 degrees here. Yeah, settling in nice. Now I got my hands away from the keyboard. Reduce my throttle a little bit more. Time to apoapsis. 57 just dropped. So I'm going to increase a little bit. Trying to keep that time to apoapsis a constant. A little bit more throttle. And I'm closing in here on 40 kilometers in altitude so I can actually start to pitch down a little bit. Get a little bit more like a rocket, maybe right around the top of that prograde vector. Hold it about there. Reduce throttle a little bit more. A 
little bit more on the throttle. My tine toe apoapsis is about a minute now. Pitch down a little bit more. Even closer, getting closer and closer to that prograde vector now that we're getting nice and high in the atmosphere. Now this is becoming very much like the upper part of a rocket ascent, which is what we are kind of shooting for. A little lower on the throttle, a little closer to that prograde vector. And we'll keep going. We're going to go for an 80 by 80 orbit, so I'm going to keep my apoapsis fairly close by, but when that gets to 80 kilometers, I'm going to be cutting my throttle. You know, now that we're well above 50 kilometers, I can just lock that right onto the prograde vector. Okay, letting that apoapsis build now, and 80 kilometers, 81 kilometers cut throttle. Now all we got to do is ride up to apoapsis and complete our orbital insertion. Okay, so that is an 80 by 80 orbit. Still have 364 meters per second left in the vehicle, which is plenty for doing orbital maneuvering while in low orbit about Kerbin, but we're not gonna be doing any of that orbital maneuvering. Instead, we're going to look at getting ourselves back down to the runway. Now, what I would strongly advise to anybody is at this stage, before you're ready to go put it on the runway, Push F5, do yourself a quick save. So if you don't end up where you want to be, you can try again, uh, especially with a brand new plane or if you're inexperienced with this. Every plane is a little bit different in its behavior, so don't expect to just get it on your first try. But I will provide you with some tips to get this done in as most consistent way as possible. So in map view, let's go to map view. One of the things I would strongly advise is always start your descent burn from the same location. So KSC, here let's put on the little thingies. The KSC is right around here. I like to start my descent about a third of an orbit ahead of where my eventual landing is going to be. So I use this peninsula here, this little uh, subcontinent that's coming down here, and I like to time warp until I'm just underneath that. If you are playing with the alternate launch sites from the DLCs, then this is actually right underneath where the Woomerang launch site is, and that kind of helps me always start my descent from the same place. Also, I always try and reduce my periapsis down to the same value. Now, I'm going to go for 35 kilometers. This is just a test with this particular plane, but if it ends up going badly, I can revert back to this point. I can come back to this location and I can try a different altitude. If I came short, then I know, oh, my altitude was too low for my periapsis. And if I went long, then I know my altitude was too high. So let's get started with that. So I'm going to go again, just time warping till I'm at right underneath that peninsula about there. I'm going to lock this onto the retrograde vector and then we're going to burn until our periapsis is at 35 kilometers. And again 35 kilometers might work for this plane, it might not. Maybe for you, you might want to try 40 kilometers or you might want to try 30 kilometers. Experiment, find out what kind of works for you. 34.9 is definitely close enough. We're then going to lock this onto the prograde vector. And I'm thinking of getting some solar exposure on these panels before. We want to have as much electric charge as you can when you come down. Uh, you will be needing those reaction wheels and they consume electricity. So we'll go until the sun comes up. There we go. Okay, we're now charging up our batteries a little bit more. I can again lock there onto the prograde vector. Now, let's get ourselves ready for our descent. What you want to do is move the center of mass as far forward as you can, and you do that by simply pumping whatever resources you have in your most forward tank. So we're going to actually activate this liquid fuel tank. We're going to go back to this back one, and we're just going to pump out everything. And the reason why you want your center of mass forward 
is because as you go through the atmosphere, if your center of mass is behind the center of lift, the plane is going to want to flip around backwards. And that can have things going sideways on you very quickly. So we're going to err on having the center of mass as far forward as possible. That's not going to be dangerous as we go through the atmosphere. And if we find it's too far forward, we can always adjust it in flight, as we'll see in a little bit. There we go, that should be pretty good. And we're gonna pin that over there to the side. And we're also gonna pin this rear tank, which is empty. And we're gonna use this to help balance our resources on our way down. Now we're very close to the atmosphere, so let's get ready for our descent first. Put your camera onto free or onto chase so that you don't get the orbit switch thing. We're gonna roll this so that the blue is up. We're going to retract any deployables that I may have. And I'm also going to press one again. That engages my whiplash engines and also opens up my air intakes. The whiplash engines, because we're in a vacuum, are clearly not going to go right now. But once they are at an altitude that they will be able to go, I'd like to potentially be able to use them. I still do have some liquid fuel left, so I might want to make use of that. So you want to be ready. And now, finally, what you want to do is come off of lock to prograde. And I like, as a default, to pitch up to about 45 degrees. I also like to put this onto surface mode, just like so. And this is kind of just a middle position. We are already losing altitude on our periapsis, thanks to drag. If I feel like I am not you know, that I'm going to overshoot. This gives me the option to pitch up. And if I feel like I'm going to undershoot, I will pitch down to carry myself further along. So use pitch to control where your landing site is going to be. Now, some people will advocate doing the S turn, which is actually what the shuttle used to do. And the S turn is turning off towards the side like that and not pitched up so high because the shuttle couldn't pitch up quite like this <laughs> but pitching over to one side going that way for a little while and then turning and pitching over to the other side and going that way for a little while so you end up doing this long sweeping s and of course that ends up you know, to, you can control where your landing spot is going to be that way. Now that's what the space shuttle did, which I think is why people advocate for it. But there are some advantages that we have that the space shuttle doesn't. Number one is we don't have to worry anywhere near as much about aerodynamic heating. The space shuttle did. The space shuttle couldn't do a crazy angle of attack like this because the heating would be disastrous. The other thing that the space shuttle doesn't have that we do are crazy strong reaction wheels that have little difficulty holding strong angles of attack like this. Um, the space shuttle can't do that. So it's simpler to control how far you're carrying just with pitch. We have that ability, the space shuttle didn't, so I wouldn't advocate for the S-turn. I would advocate simply to do it the simple way, which is simply to pitch up and down to control where you're going. Now let's take a look at sort of what our trajectory is doing. See here, our periapsis is just about to dip in. I'm pretty happy with this so far. We are still very high in the atmosphere, so let's do a little bit of time warping until we start to see some atmospheric effects starting to kick in. And while I'm doing that, I'm also watching this here. The ideal place where I want this for now is just past where the KSC is. Here, let's put this on again so you can see it. So I want this to be just past where the KSC is. And if I feel like this is starting to come too close, remember I can just simply pitch down. Or if I feel like this is not coming close enough, I can start to pitch up. But my goal is to get this, where this is going into the surface, just past where the KSC is. Right now I think this is still going pretty good, so I'm gonna put it back at about 45 degrees. Let's go back to our vessel. I can see now, put this on, I am pitched hard up and this thing wants to fall forward. Remember, you do have some control. We have a lot of mass towards the front of this. So because this thing really wants to fall forward, why not take some of that mass and put it out? Put it uh, back towards the back. See if that helps me hold my attitude. I still want my mass forward enough that this thing does want to pitch down and it still does. 
So we'll put a little bit of this liquid fuel. Don't do this to the point where you flip around backwards, but it will help you kind of hold altitude. And so you have some balance control here. Use this stuff here as ballast. Okay, let's see. Oh, I can see now where my, so I'm gonna pitch down a little bit, just like so. Again, I'm pretty happy where, where that is just past where the KSC is, so I'm gonna pitch down. I do not want to lose too much speed. I wanna carry this for a little while. We definitely want to lose speed here. You don't wanna to get too low into the atmosphere going at a crazy high speed, but don't forget, we were flying through the atmosphere at 1.3 kilometers per second at an altitude lower than this, and things were fine. So if I can get that speed down in around the 1.2, 1.3 kilometer per second range before I get down to around 18 kilometers, I'm fine. So I'm now pitching up as hard as I can, trying to bleed off a little bit more speed. This is my first time landing this plane and in talking through the descent, I wasn't aggressive enough earlier on. Uh, so we are definitely overshooting at this point. And I thought about redoing this and doing another go and coming down in much more textbook type of descent. And I thought, no, I wanna show you, this is by no means a disaster. We can start doing some S turns if I wanted to. What I ended up doing was flipping myself right over upside down. I mean, this thing does want to fall forward. So why not just let gravity help me do some of this work? I should also point out that in terms of the game, there's absolutely nothing with ditching this into the ocean. You can land easier in the ocean than you can on the runway, and the cost penalty for doing so isn't really all that much. So if you want, you can just put it down into the ocean, but there is kind of a source of pride of putting it down onto the runway. But you can see I did let myself carry too far, but you can see here how much flexibility you have. So it's not exactly textbook here but it's working I should have been pitching up a little bit more aggressively a little earlier probably want to throttle up here a little bit to just kind of pull myself out of this dive we are we are coming out fine turn off those engines okay we are just now gone subsonic <laughs> pitching up pitching up let's put this on terrain and we definitely want to slow down here so Pitching up here, just a bleed off speed. And then we're gonna go back down. A little bit of wobbly, wibbly wobblies to sort of do that. Descending the landing gear would always be a great idea. And there we are. Not exactly textbook, but just to show you just how much flexibility. Should have been more aggressive coming down, but you know, as you get used to planes and don't talk as much, you can do it. But there we go, first try. Again, bleeding off speed a little bit, like to touch down at around 60, 70 meters per second. This thing is still very nose heavy. <laughs> I should have maybe put more, more fuel towards the back, but that's okay. We got it. Okay. And there we go. Brakes on and we are down. And that means we're on to our next space plane. Now for our next plane, we want to unlock one more node. It's way down here towards the end of this aerodynamic stream and it is aerospace tech. There's only one part here, the CR-7 Rapier engine. We're going to lock that for 1000 science points. We're gonna build one more space plane. So we'll bring back up here the one we just flew, and we're going to be really simple with this. We're gonna tear off all of these engines, and we're going to replace them with our newly unlocked CR-7 Rapier engine, two-way symmetry, and there we go. Now, let's talk a little bit about the Rapier. Pin this right here, we can see that like the Panthers that we were looking at last episode, it has this toggle mode button. We start in air breathing mode, and then if we toggle the mode, it says now closed cycle mode. What that means is that this thing can be a jet engine in air breathing mode, where it's pulling oxygen out of the atmosphere using the intakes, but then if you toggle mode and we go into closed cycle mode, it begins using the oxidizer that's built into the jet. So this engine is a combination jet engine, 
and rocket engines. So instead of having four engines, we actually only need these two to get the whole thing done. So what I'm gonna be doing is simply going to my aerodynamics, getting those aerodynamic nose cones back and sticking those on the back, to clean that part off. And this really is our whole plane. Let's take a look at the rapier stats and compare it to what we've been looking at so far. In air breathing mode, we can see that the rapier actually has a significantly higher maximum thrust than the whiplash does, which is great for our purposes, though its ISP is lower, so it will be using up more liquid fuel to get up to that max speed that we want. But don't forget, we're also shedding 1.6 tons of mass by going from four engines to two engines, so that's going to help us as well. Going to vacuum mode, we can see that the vacuum thrust of the rapier is exactly the same as that for the dart. So we're gonna see very similar performance on that end, though its ISP of 305 seconds is significantly lower than the dart. So when we are in space, we should be expecting to use up more propellant. Now, we're only gonna be in low carbon orbit. That's not a big deal. But if you are going to build a space plane that's going to go further than that and fly around out in deeper space, you probably don't want to use the rapiers for that because of their low ISP. You'll be burning a lot more fuel. And of course, that means you have to carry that fuel with you. But a nice combination if you wanna make a vessel that go further is to simply Keep the rapiers on there for getting yourself into orbit, but then switch to nuclear engines for doing the distance part of it. Obviously, that requires some rebalancing of the entire plane, more liquid fuel or more liquid fuel and oxidizer being put on to get your distances, but that's how you end up building a long distance SSTO. I do have to reset up my action group. Remember with uh, the rapiers here, I'm gonna put on an action group one. What I wanna notice that the shock cones are already being toggled off with action group one, but what I want to do with the rapiers is not toggle the engine, but rather switch mode. Other than that, I just had to move the wings a little bit. Remember we did lose a lot of mass here at the back and this thing is ready to fly. Now remember, we do have a contract to rescue Alec A. Kerman from orbit. There is Alec A. We will set him as a target. He is in a 78 by 80, 283 kilometer orbit. So I'm going to make the plan to get into an orbit that's a little higher. I'm going to shoot for a 100 kilometer orbit. And that means I need to want to be ahead of him because he will be traveling faster than me and allow him to catch up to me for the rendezvous. One thing to be aware of when it comes to space planes is that it takes longer to get up into orbit with a space plane than it does to get up into orbit with a rocket. So be aware of that. You don't want to end up, for instance, because you spent so much time ending up behind this target. So I want to launch way ahead of him. So let's do some time warping. If it means I spend a little bit more time in orbit, that's perfectly fine. Let's stop about here. All right. And this thing is ready to go. And if Alec A seems like a very unkerbally name, that is because he is just one of my wonderful Patreon patrons and YouTube members who help to support this channel. And why don't I use this opportunity to welcome aboard my most recent patrons and members, Max Shepelev, Mark Van Melly, Stephen Post, and Aaron Johnson. A most heartfelt thanks goes out to my newest members, which of course is extended to everyone that helps to support this channel, even if it's just with a like and a subscribe. As far as flying with the rapier engines, it's absolutely no different than before. I'm keeping the pitch at about 10 degrees until I'm around a 20 kilometer altitude where I build up as much speed as I can while still in air breathing mode. It is worth pointing out how much more speed I'm getting now thanks to the lower mass and higher thrust that the rapiers provide, topping out at over 1.5 kilometers per second. When that speed begins to max out, I switch over to closed cycle mode and begin riding this up like a rocket. It's also worth noting how much higher the remaining delta V is after achieving my orbit. This is despite this orbit actually being a little higher than before. 
After that, it was setting up our rendezvous and heading over to pick up Alec. And as I've done tons of rendezvous in this series already, I'll be referring you to the Rescuing Kerbals video I linked to earlier that you will also find linked down below this video. And while Jeb and Valve close in on Alec, why don't I take this opportunity to go over the main takeaways from this episode. I looked at a variety of engine combinations that can be used when building SSTO space planes. Although I limited myself to the Whiplash, Dart and Rapier, it should be noted that many other combinations are still possible. Likely the most challenging aspect of these builds is balancing the amount of liquid fuel and oxidizer. With the mix of air breathing and rocket modes, the Delta V calculations really aren't that useful, leaving the only method left is to build, test and repeat until you are satisfied with the result. I also spent some time going over the ascent profile, starting with a shallow ascent allowing the jet engines to pick up speed and then switching to rocket mode when the speed begins to max out, which usually happens at around an altitude of 20 kilometers. And finally, I looked at how to use pitch to affect the drag profile of the space plane, allowing you to guide it safely back to the runway, even when your descent is less than textbook. And with that, I'm going to be drawing this episode to a close. I hope that you found it useful and that I'll be seeing you around for my next video.